Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, we're happy and proud to have here with us today Yaakov Babichenko. Uh, he did his PhD in the Hebrew University and then a postdoc in Caltech. And now he's an associate professor at the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. He got the Creel Award for Research of Excellence in 2018. And he studies mainly adaptive, learn adaptive learning and complexity of equilibrium. And he will talk to us today about optimal persuasion via bit pooling. And Yaakov, the stage is yours. Jugalit, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, so the talk is about uh, optimal persuasion via bit pooling. This is a joint work with uh, Itai Ariely and Rans Morodinsky, my colleagues at the Technion, and with Takuro Yamashita from Toulouse. Okay, so let me jump directly to the model that we will study today. The model is essentially a Bayesian persuasion uh, model with continuum of states where receiver cares only of posterior bits. Okay, this is the model that uh, this talk will be about. Uh, uh, I will explain each of these terms. Bayesian persuasion is essentially a, cheat, a, a communication where the sender, a communication problem, strategic communication problem where the sender is allowed to commit to his uh, signaling policy before he knows the state. Uh, the state. Uh, before the state is realized. Uh, continuum of states, uh, this is, yeah, I think it's uh, clear. And what is, uh, does it exactly mean that receiver cares only of posterior means? Uh, I will explain it in a, uh, in a few moments. Uh, let me just maybe say that this is not the first paper that studies this model. In fact, recently there are quite a few papers that uh, focus on this uh, particular model. Uh, maybe Dvorak and Martini is a paper entirely about this paper, but it is also indirectly or directly mentioned uh, in uh, quite a few other papers, uh, uh, as you can see. So, okay. So uh, let me le let me start with the model. Okay. So we have single sender, single receiver, a continuum of state, one-dimensional continuum of state zero one, and a common prior, which is a distribution over the states. In this case, it's a distribution over the segment zero one. Uh, and now we have uh, an abstract set of signals, uh, which we will identify also with the segment uh, zero, zero one by the direct relation principle, essentially. But uh, we have, in principle, we can have a, uh, an abstract set of uh, signals. And a policy, a signaling policy of the sender is essentially a distribution, uh, sorry, a mapping from the states, which in this case is the segment zero one, to distribution over states. Once a receiver observes a signal, he forms a posterior about the, uh, the state. So he starts with the prior F. And uh, after observing uh, a state S, his posterior, let's say, uh, let, let's call it, will be Q of S, which is, uh, the, again, it's a distribution over the state. And the posterior mean assumption that I just told you before is the following. Assume, uh, uh, co let's consider two different distributions uh, over the state, uh, or, or uh, two different posteriors. One is Q and the second is Q prime. Uh, and uh, if, if it is the case that the expectation of Q equals to the expectation of Q prime, then the assumption tells us that receiver takes this, uh, will take the same uh, action. His best reply action will be the same. And since in a, uh, and uh, therefore his effect essentially on sender's utility will be the same, okay? So this is the posterior mean assumption. Uh, in a moment, I also will give some interpretation for, for, this, uh, uh, for this posterior mean uh, assumption and see where, where, uh, where it naturally ar arises. Uh, but uh, before that, let me just remind you or tell you what is the uh, timing of interaction in the Bayesian persuasion model. So as I said before, 
in the Bayesian persuasion uh, setting, sender has the commitment power and he can commit to a signaling policy before state is realized. So he commits to a signaling policy. Then state is realized according to the common prior. Signal is realized according to the committed policy. Receiver observes the signal, forms a posterior, and takes an action which determines sender's utility. Okay, so this is the, the kind of standard uh, uh, Bayesian persuasion uh, model. Okay, so and now let me say a few words about uh, the posterior mean assumption uh, that I just uh, said. So uh, which motivation can we give uh, to, the, to this uh, assumption? So uh, Dvorak and Martini uh, gave uh, several... Uh, and motivations uh, that follow essentially from the risk aversion of the, of the receiver in their case, which is uh, uh, a principal agent uh, 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 in, in a principal agent models that it might, uh, they, they have uh, several examples where this uh, assumption is natural in investment recommendation, it also can be natural. But let me give you yet another motivation for the problem, for, for this uh, risk, uh, uh, for this uh, posterior mean assumption, which has not been mentioned in Borzak and Martini, and no, uh, also not in the other papers. And I think it's quite a cute uh, interpretation. Let's consider a standard uh, Bayesian persuasion uh, setting, but not with a continuum of states, but rather with just binary state. The, the original state was called omega, and here I call it theta, okay? Theta is a binary state. But now, instead of assuming that the sender is fully informed about the state as it is assumed in the, in the standard model, uh, in the standard Bayesian persuasion model, it is assumed that the sender, uh, his policy is a mapping from the states, to, a sign to signals, which means that sender essentially knows the, uh, uh, knows the state. Instead, let us assume that uh, sender only receives some information about the state. Namely, he, he's also partially informed. He's not, uh, he doesn't fully know the, the state. So theta is, a, uh, is just a binary state, either zero or one. Omega in this case, which is our, is sender's belief about uh, theta, which is commonly known to be distributed according to F. Okay, so how this, this can erase essentially from some information, commonly known uh, way that uh, 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 commonly, no, uh, uh, commonly known dist uh, distribution of, uh, of posteriors, uh, namely, sender is partially informed about the state and the way the sender is partially informed is commonly known by the sender and by the receiver, okay? Now, receiver's utility is essentially, I, what I want to emphasize, let's focus on a model where receiver utility is obviously a function of his own action, but, uh, and also of this, the, the binary state, okay? So his utility is only a function of the binary state, he doesn't care what the, what is the, uh, the the posterior of uh, uh, of the sender, uh, and, the, and now receiver's belief about theta is precisely the expectation of Q of S. Okay, so this is another nice in, uh, cute interpretation of the more of the posterior mean assumption. Namely, if you take a standard binary signal uh, Bayesian persuasion problem but add to it a modification that sender is not fully informed about this, the state, but rather receives some partial information about it, you get exactly the model that we are going to study today, okay? So posterior uh, mean assumption is satisfied in this model. So from here, about, uh, I will, uh, go, I'm going back to this, uh, standard uh, the, the model where with continuum of states, which is essentially equivalent to the partially informed, but uh, this was just one interpretation. <laughs> what is our objective in this talk? Essentially, uh, right, so maybe the, the most natural question that we can ask 
is uh, to gain understanding on how to solve persuasion problems with continuum state space. Okay, this is maybe the most natural uh, uh, thing that we would like to do. But let me mention another one. Uh, uh, that the second, uh, our second objective, which in fact will be the first in all the, 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 of the presentation, is to characterize the structure of optimal policies in such problems. Okay, and so, and the one, I think, uh, independently, it's a natural question to ask, but moreover, we will see that a, such a characterization will also assist us in understanding, gain understanding on question number one, namely how to really solve uh, persuasion problems in continuum state space. Okay, and uh, maybe uh, let me say a few words, what exactly do I mean by saying that what a, uh, a characterization of optimal policy structure. So essentially what we, what we are looking for is a, for, to find as small as possible subset of policies, pi is the set of all policies. From them, we want to look on only some restricted subset such that every persuasion problem will admit an optimal solution in this set. This, this will tell us that essentially, okay, we, uh, we found the, uh, yeah, so, so uh, you always can pick uh, uh, calligraphic P to be exactly pi, <laughs> yeah, but, but essentially we, we, we want more than that, yeah, we wanted this, uh, uh, this set to be as small as possible, and later I also will convince you that the fact, the answer that I give you is in fact the smallest possible. Okay, we will have a characterization and uh, that, that, uh, that essentially will, will pick the smallest possible uh, uh, sub, subclass of policies. Uh, okay, so just to, again, to, to make you some reminder uh, and also to introduce this, maybe not the most standard uh, question of characterization of optimal policies, let me go uh, quickly over the simple case of binary state persuasion problem. In this case, the, the, set, of, uh, the set of policies that they characterize as uh, optimal policy is the set of all binary signal policies, okay? We have many policies uh, in this case, but binary policies are sufficient and moreover, they are the smallest possible set. And let me try to convince you in that. Okay, so how we solve Bayesian persuasion problems in binary state space. Okay, so uh, the notion, essentially, the notion of concavification, uh, it essentially tells us everything that we need to know about the binary, uh, in order to solve a binary state persuasion problem. And uh, let me demonstrate it by an example. Okay, so uh, let's draw a, uh, a curve that uh, corresponds to the utility of the sender as a function of receiver's posterior. Okay, if receiver posterior is 0 0.6, for instance, this point, then he will take some action. And with this, uh, he will take his optimal action. And this action will yield a utility of this value for the center. Okay, this is the, the, the function that we draw. Mm. And by the way, from the ju just uh, you can uh, see from the picture that essentially in this uh, in this specific problem we have a continuum of actions for the receiver. Right, we can see it because uh, sender get, uh, gets infinitely uh, con a continuum of, of different utilities. So uh, along all this talk. We will not restrict ourselves to finite number of uh, um, of actions for the receiver. Okay, uh, it can be an arbitrary set of uh, actions for the for the receiver. Okay, so essentially, what Alman and Mashler have uh, suggested, and uh, it was uh, later uh, uh, used in uh, in the context of Bayesian persuasion by Kaminsky and Getko is uh, the notion, they suggested the notion of concavification, which is the uh, minimal uh, uh, concave uh, function that is pointwise above 
the, the, this utility function. You can see it here in uh, red. And uh, in order to understand what is sender's optimal utility in the persuasion problem, it's essentially the value of the, the concavification at the, point, at the point of the prior, okay? Moreover, we can also deduce from this picture what is the optimal policy for the, for the sender. <coughs> His optimal policy will be to use two signals that will be essentially the prior here will be split into two atoms, uh, one on this red point and the other on, the, on the, this red point. And uh, essentially the, uh, his optimal policy will induce two different posteriors for the receiver, only this one and this one, okay? Um, so this is essentially summarizes uh, uh, the, essentially the solution for the binary state policy. Uh, so structure of optimal policy in basic, uh, in basic persuasion, in, in binary state persuasion, is essentially that binary signals are sufficient to persuade optimally, right? We can see here that the con for the concavification, we need only at most two, two points. Uh, and any pair of binary posteriors can be the unique solution of a persuasion problem, uh, whereby any, I mean that one posterior obviously has to be above the prior and the other has to be below the prior, right? Because these two points has to satisfy essentially the expectation, expectation of the posteriors must be equal to the prior. So, uh, uh, so obviously one should be above and the second should be below. Uh, why do I mention bullet number two? This is exactly to show you that uh, we found the smallest possible set, okay? Uh, if we, our objective is not just to come up with some set of policies because maybe among the binary signaling policies, there are many, we can significantly reduce it. And in fact, maybe many of the policies there are not needed. So the second bullet shows us that this is not the case, that indeed, every uh, binary posteriors can be the unique solution of persuasion problems. And therefore we, uh, we essentially need all of them, okay? So this, this is what I mean by characterization. And uh, our goal is uh, going back to the, uh, uh, wait, sorry, uh, sorry, what? what? <laughs> And uh, sorry, sorry. So there were two slides that I forgot to, to raise. Uh, uh, oh. Uh, so yeah. So so my mistake that there was. Uh, okay. So let's proceed for me. So uh, 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 so so going back to our question, what is the structure of optimal policy in the continuum state space uh, problem or also in the partially informed sender problem. So maybe the first approach to tackle the problem uh, is, uh, uh, this is just a standard Bayesian persuasion model with uh, the state space uh, zero one. Uh, so use the concavification result in this space. Unfortunately, in high dimensional uh, spaces, the concavification result is not very informative. Namely, it's obviously it is still remains to be true that the optimal utility that the receiver can get is a concavification of the function, but this is, it's a concavification in, a, in an infinite dimensional state space. And uh, this notion is not very convenient to work with. And uh, in fact, uh, it doesn't uh, tell us, uh, it, it, it's how to deduce from it some uh, uh, meaningful uh, uh, insights about the problem. Uh, so uh, we need a different approach and the, the different approach, which has been suggested uh, in previous literature in this context, essentially kind of, uh, uh, focus, it's a mean, pre, uh, uh, mean preserving uh, contractions approach. What is uh, essentially due to the posterior mean assumption, that means that, uh, that I, I remind you, it tells you that the receiver will take exactly the same action if, the, uh, if uh, for two different posteriors with, with, the, with the same uh, posterior mean. 
therefore sender cares only about the distribution over posterior means, okay? He doesn't care exactly what will be his, the posterior of the sender in, uh, in each uh, of the cases. He only cares about what is the distribution over posterior means that his policy induces. Okay, so which distribution of our posterior means are implementable, namely can be implemented by some signaling policy. So this question has a very neat and uh, clean characterization. A distribution of our posterior means is implementable by some signaling policy, if and only if G is a mean preserving contraction of the prior. Okay, so, uh, uh, and uh, this uh, observation essentially helps us in um, understanding better the persuasion problem because we do not have to look on distribution over posteriors, which is a distribution over distributions of zero one, but uh, instead we can look on uh, mean preserving contractions, which are only distributions over zero one, a simpler object, okay? Uh, our goal is to find a simple class of mean preserving contractions that is sufficient to solve optimally every persuasion problem. Okay, this is exactly what I said, uh, a, a characterization essentially to find as small as possible and also as simple as possible the uh, class of mean preserving contractions. Uh, the first, uh, maybe the first in simplicity, let me suggest you one class of uh, uh, simple uh, mean preserving contractions that is sufficient to, to persuade optimally. And, uh, sorry, that maybe, uh, uh, but at least it's quite simple class is that of pooling contractions. Okay, so to understand what pooling contractions are, let me draw you a picture, uh, show, uh, demonstrate it to you by a picture. Okay, we have here uh, the prior, which is a distribution over zero one. And uh, a policy, a pooling policy, essentially what it does, it looks on, uh, it defines some subset or some uh, that's, uh, account, uh, countably many or finitely many um, uh, intervals. And inside this interval, it only reveals that the, the state is inside the, uh, uh, this interval which will pull all the, this uh, entire segment to, a, to an atom on this point, okay? And uh, the same, uh, so in each interval, it will reveal only that it appears in this interval. Outside of this interval, I will, uh, the, the policy reveals exactly the state, okay? Therefore, the post here, the, post the, the mapping is essentially identity. And here it, uh, it maps all the entire interval into an atom. Okay, uh, and uh, maybe the, the first question uh, is, are pooling contractions sufficiently rich to optimize every per persuasion problem? By the way, uh, this, uh, the class of pooling policies is indeed uh, quite a simple class. And for instance, in the classical paper of uh, uh, Clifford and Sobel uh, you know, on chip talk, essentially the, the, the type of policies that are optimal in their setting is, are essentially uh, pu pooling policies uh, where indeed you reveal only in which interval, uh, to which interval it belongs. Uh, the answer to, the, to this question is unfortunately no. The, this class of policies is not sufficiently rich to optimize every persuasion problem. And let me show you a counter example. Uh, let's think uh, of uh, the, uh, the prior to be uniform on zero one, okay? And sender's utility is this curve. All is, that is important about this curve that it has two global maxima, one at the point uh, one third and one at the point two thirds, okay? So essentially an optimal policy in this setting will be to contract somehow the segment zero one to one third and to two thirds. Uh, is it possible to do? Is it possible to contract zero one to one third and two thirds? Yes, it is possible. Let me show you one way to do it. If you pull 
the segment 1 over 12, 7 over 12, which exactly has a mass of, uh, of uh, half, uh, into uh, one third, right? If you, if you reveal to the sender whether the, uh, the, the state is in the segment 1 over 12, 7 over 12, or not, then his posterior here uh, with probability half, his posterior will be, uh, his posterior mean will be one third. And with probability half, his posterior mean will be two thirds. Okay. Um, so the, it can be done, but it, it is impossible to do it via, B pool, uh, via pool, pooling policies. Roughly speaking, the, the, the intuition you, you, you write is that low segments, you have to pull them somehow. Uh, you are allowed only to use uh, disjoint signals and uh, intervals and pull them. So the only candidate uh, to pull uh, uh, to the low posterior is the segment uh, zero to one half. But <coughs> But zero to one half is contracted, unfortunately, to one quarter and not to one third. Okay, so it is impossible to do it with pooling policies. So the next kind of the second in simplicity class of uh, mean preserving contractions is that of B pooling contractions. This is also the title of this the, the, the talk. So it, play, uh, it will play a significant role in this talk. What are the B pooling contractions? Essentially, we do everything quite similarly to how we do in pooling, and only allowing for one additional uh, flexibility. As previously, I uh, partition the interval 0, 1 into countably many. <coughs> into countably many uh, intervals and uh, I have the uh, and the complement of it which is uh, the, the other point but in e inside each interval I'm allowing either to send a signal a single signal which will pull all the posterior into into its expectation or I'm allowing also to send two signals inside um, inside an interval, and then it may create two atoms on this uh, uh, inside this interval. Okay, so this is the picture of a B pooling contraction. It has pooling intervals and it has B pooling intervals. Okay, and uh, let me tell you the the concrete definition of it, of B pooling, not with a picture. So uh, essentially, a, we are talking about con, uh, mean preserving contractions of the prior. So uh, a mean preserving contraction of the prior G is a B pooling contraction if there exists uh, as a, a countable uh, sequence of intervals, uh, countable uh, of disjoint intervals. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to say that those should be disjoint intervals. Uh, I didn't write it. Such that uh, on, on each of these intervals, this, the distribution G is a mean preserving contraction of the distribution F, okay? This entire segment is mapped into uh, some binary support distribution, right? And G is a distribution with support of at most two. And the second uh, property is that outside of all these intervals, uh, we G coincides with it. Okay, the distribution is exactly the same. Uh, the, the identity mapping is, uh, means that uh, uh, essentially the distribution doesn't change. Okay. Uh, so our main result. Uh, is that this class of policies is sufficient to optimize every persuasion problem. Every persuasion problem admits a B-pooling contraction optimal solution. And our second main theorem, just to convince you that, uh, that essentially we, we picked the smallest possible subset is uh, also uh, shows that for, uh, if you give me a, a, a B-pooling contraction, 
there exists some persuasion problem, namely a utility with, uh, uh, in fact, for every prior that exists a utility, for which this contraction is the unique optimal solution. Namely, we cannot, uh, it's not that we found some subset of, policy, uh, of policies that is sufficiently rich to, to, uh, to, to, to solve optimally every problem. It's exactly the smallest possible uh, subset of policies uh, that, uh, that, that has this property, okay? Uh, I will not tell you uh, details about the proof of theorem two, but let me tell you about theorem one, about the uh, kind of uh, the idea. Uh, in fact, uh, almost, uh, it's almost the proof, uh, uh, the idea of, uh, of, the, uh, of uh, the proof of theorem one. So let's think again, uh, again about what, uh, what essentially is uh, Sanders' uh, uh, problem. Sanders' problem is to maximize, right, what if he, uh, so uh, by colotilling and uh, by, by, by uh, uh, colotilling and also by uh, Genskov and Kamenica, and essentially uh, he is able by pooling policies to produce any mean preserving contraction. Okay, any mean preserving contraction of the prior is something that he is able to, to do. So among all these uh, mean preserving contractions, he want to find the one that maximizes his utility. Okay, so this is essentially Sanders optimization problem. Maximize over all the mean preserving contractions, the expected utility. Okay, so this is what he- Yako. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, uh, just a clarifying question. When you, the, the uh, sender's policy is a deterministic function, must be a deterministic function of the state? So the answer is no. Uh, it, it does, uh, so, the, uh, so the question, maybe let's go back to this, uh, uh, to this picture. The question was whether the, uh, we restrict uh, our attention to uh, deterministic uh, policies, namely without uh, tossing coins in each of these continuum of states, or we allow also. Uh, mm, so at this point, I do not want to impose such a restriction of deterministic policies. In fact, deterministic policies are quite rich in this setting, and uh, you can, for instance, implement uh, every uh, B pooling contraction also by deterministic policies. You do not need the randomization for that. But uh, yeah, so this is the question. But the issue of uh, pure versus mixed uh, signaling policies uh, will, uh, uh, will come later in the, in the talk. But uh, what I don't understand is suppose the uh, prior, the sender's prior is, uh, has only finitely many points in its support. How can you make such a, how do you implement a pooling policy? Uh, right, right. So, so yeah, so, so, so for, for, for the purposes of this talk, let's think of F as non atomic distribution. Okay. And, but uh, if you want a generalization of the notion of B pooling uh, in the context of uh, uh, in, uh, in, in cases where you do allow atoms, then you obviously need to allow uh, the sender also to split mass and indeed to use ma mixed strategies, namely an interval can, can be located exactly in some interval and part of the mass of this atom can go to, can belong to one uh, subset and the other part can belong to the second. Okay? Okay. You do need indeed for, 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 for cases, uh, for the case where F is atomic, you need mi uh, uh, mixed, uh, mixed signaling policies to implement any B pooling uh, contraction. Okay, thanks. Uh, so 
the, the class of mean preserving contractions is essentially a convex and compact set in the weak topology in the space of uh, uh, distributions over the one. And uh, the objective is a linear objective, right? Expectation is a linear objective in, the, in, the, in this uh, context. So by Bauer uh, maximum principles, it achieves a maximum in an extreme point. Okay, we have an infinite dimensional uh, space and we have a linear objective over this uh, uh, infinite dimensional space. So the, the maximum is obtained in, a, uh, in an extreme point. So essentially our theorem one is, uh, is based on, a, on, on, a, on the characterization of mean preserving contractions. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, we didn't find this uh, uh, characterization uh, in the in previous literature. By the way, there is an, so let me just tell you, the extreme points of the mean preserving contractions are precisely the B-pooling contractions, okay? This is the characterization of what are the extreme points of mean preserving contractions. And this proposition might be of independent interest. And in fact, it, it is, it has many other uses, but uh, this, this exact characterization also uh, has been independently proved by another paper uh, from just uh, independently in parallel to, to ours uh, by Kleiner, Moldovano and Stark. And they show quite a few other very interesting uh, in, uh, uses of this uh, characterization in the context of optimal delegation and in the context of uh, mechanism design and in particular in the ranked item options. Okay, so this is, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the, uh, right, so, so since mean preserving spreads and mean preserving contractions play quite central role in uh, uh, in different uh, economic models, uh, it's uh, indeed, uh, indeed 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 has quite a, quite a few uses. If uh, once we understand the extreme points of it, and uh, Kleiner, Moldovano, and Stark showed quite uh, quite a few of them in their uh, recent paper. Uh, yeah, and and uh, independently of us, they also. Uh, came up with, with this characterization of the b pooling contraction. Okay, so this is, uh, now I talked about characterization, but essentially the goal of, uh, one of the things of the goals uh, uh, of, uh, now what I want to try to show you is that essentially using this characterization, we maybe are able also to solve uh, or to gain some understanding about how so how to solve uh, uh, the, the, the 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 persuasion problems. So one approach, which is not new, um, uh, uh, is a convex programming approach, and I will go very briefly about this result. But uh, then I want to talk about another. Uh, uh, technique uh, or you can say algorithm for solving uh, persuasion problems uh, that is based on guessing uh, Dvorak Martini's price function. Okay, so what is Dvorak Martini price function and what does it mean guessing it? it uh, I, I will explain you in, a <coughs> in a moment. Uh, let me go very, very briefly uh, on the convex programming approach. Uh, so uh, a special case that we can consider, which corresponds to the case uh, where a uh, receiver has finitely many action, is the case where sender's utility is piecewise constant and it has n pieces. Okay, so this, uh, this corresponds to the case where uh, receiver has n actions. So in this case, we know to, uh, th there exists a polynomial in N algorithm for finding the optimal policy. And uh, this algorithm is based on the convex uh, programming approach. Uh, 
It is similar to, uh, it improves upon a result of Kandogan who also used convex programming, who proved that same result for the case of monotonic piecewise constant utilities. In fact, we show that monotonicity is not needed there and uh, it can be solved without, mon that monotonicity is not an issue uh, that is needed there. Uh, and obviously once we have a, uh, an exact algorithm for piecewise constant uh, functions we can always apply to solve any, let's say, Lifshitz function uh, just by approximating the function by piecewise constant functions and uh, applying, uh, applying this algorithm. And so this is in terms of uh, kind of computational algorithmic uh, approach. But uh, let me tell you about the second approach, which is uh, by trying solving persuasion problems by guessing Martini's Dvorak Martini price function. One of the reasons why I think it's needed is essentially that the convex programming uh, algorithm, okay, it's an algorithm, but essentially we, we do not, uh, uh, maybe the computer can solve it, but it doesn't visualize what, uh, what is the solution, uh, etc. And uh, I think one of the nice things about the Dvorak Martini price function, except for the fact that it uh, solve explicitly, it might solve explicitly uh, functions, uh, let's say smooth, uh, for the case where you use smooth, a smooth function, which is not included in these two results, not, not uh, approximately, but explicitly solving uh, uh, functions. It also visualizes and essentially shows us uh, what and or how an optimal policy should, should, should look like. Uh, visualization is similar to how, uh, in the spirit of how, let's say, concavification, one of the nicest things about it, that essentially we can draw a picture that essentially tells us everything about the problem, unlike, let's say, the convex uh, programming approach that uh, where we cannot draw anything which you can just write a computer program with it. Okay, so let me tell you what Dvorak Martini price function is. So <coughs> a, a function uh, uh, P uh, from zero one to the reals is called the price function of G uh, in the problem F, U. F, U, F, I will call it is a prior. U is the uh, G is a mean preserving contraction of F. And uh, now we have another element P, which is a price function. And uh, uh, it is a price function if it satisfies all the above conditions. First of all, it has to be pointwise above the utility. Second, it should be convex, okay? Unlike concavification, convex, not concave, convex. A third uh, property that the support or, or in places where uh, where uh, where G has positive support, we must have identi uh, identity between the the price function and the utility. Okay, and finally, the last property is the expect the, the expectation of the price function over G and over F should be equal. Okay, uh, I think the best way to understand this property is by drawing you a price function. Okay, so think of G to be a, some mean preserving contraction of uh, uh, here we mean preserve zero to Y is contracted to these two points. Y, Y prime is contracted to Z3 and essentially Y prime to one it uh, goes essentially uh, by identity, okay? It's uh, not contracted uh, at all. So, <coughs> um, so as we can see, the, the, this black function is pointwise above the function, uh, and, uh, the utility function. The, the black function is pointwise above the blue function. Um, second, you can see that P is con convex, right? You can see that it's convex. Third, in all points where in the support of G, 
which consists of the, these three atoms, Z, Z1, Z2, Z3, and the segment, the, the tiny segment Y prime one, which is this segment, over this entire segment, we have uh, that, the, uh, that the, the, the functions coincide. Finally, to see the last property, we can just look uh, at uh, in each segment separately. So in the segment zero, uh, zero to Y, since the, the, so the expectation of the, since the, the, the function P is linear, so, and the, the mean preserving contraction obviously uh, uh, preserves expectation. So essentially the expectation of for the, let's say the, the, the distribution according to F of this linear function and according to G is some point here in the middle. The same uh, for, for here, the according to F and according to G, it will be precisely this point. And here we obviously will have this property. So this is an example of a price function. Okay, so the, the black function is a price function of the, uh, the, uh, of the function of the blue function. And what is the main result of Dvorak and Martini? If G, if some mean preserving contraction admits a price function, then necessarily G is optimal, okay? And the second main result is that every optimal G admits a price function. Going back to this example, it means that essentially the, the policy that B pulls the segment zero to Y to Z1 and Z2, and it pulls the segment Y to Y prime into Z3, and it fully reveals the state in the uh, segment Y prime to one, uh, is an optimal policy for this problem, okay? So the main theorem of Dvorak and Martini is essentially that uh, every uh, optimal solution admits a price function, uh, which is the second uh, point is, the, and also that if G admits a price function, then uh, it is also optimal. Uh, can I, may I ask a question now or shall I wait till the end? Sure, sure. It's a great uh, time for a question. Yeah. Go please back one slide. Yeah. Yes, here, if you, between zero and Z1, if you made the function P, to go, uh, well, I, I, what I basically mean is that you can still be con convex if you go like down and then up linearly. But actually, no, here it looks, but what I, you can, let's say from a little bit left to Z1. A little bit left to Z1. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you can just go linearly to somewhere in the middle between zero and Z1 to the lowermost lower most point. And yeah. then you can go up to zero, right? Linearly. Approximately so, as I draw it here? Yes, something like that. And then you will go here and from here you will not have a way to continue it. Uh, yeah, you're right. And so it, it, it will eventually be not convex. You're right, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, indeed. Uh, yeah. Th this is exactly my next slide. Will 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 show how to play with this figure in order that it will uh, will will be satisfied. Uh, but uh, so the interpretation of the price function that Dvorak and Martin gave uh, is essentially some uh, very nice story of Valerian equilibrium in a persuasion economy. So this was kind of their. Uh, interpretation of this uh, result. Uh, let me tell you maybe uh, another uh, kind of natural interpretation of this uh, result is, let's say that someone, uh, uh, you, uh, you tell me that, you know what, the optimal thing to do here is to contract the segment zero y, uh, zero y to z1 and z2 to, to, uh, to contract the, to pull the segment y, y prime to z3 and to fully reveal the state at, from y prime to one. And I'm telling you, I don't believe you. Please convince me that this is the case. How can you convince me? Okay, so exhaustively searching over all the policies is something non-efficient, right? Uh, but what is, so this is in some sense, a succinct evidence for optimality of G, 
if you should provide me this function, now I know that there is nothing better than what you just said, okay? So this is another interpretation of this result. Okay, uh, so what I want to show you is essentially the, the, uh, the plan is uh, to show you how to find the price function. And uh, uh, obviously once we found the price function, we it can easily deduce from it what is the, the optimal policy. Optimal can be deduced quite easily from the price function. The challenge is to find the price function. I showed you a picture with the function and with the utility and with the function, but typically we just get an, as an input the, the utility and we have somehow to guess what the price function is. Okay, so our proposition, which is not very hard, essentially it, yields, uh, it uh, relies on Jensen, uh, Jensen inequality, tells us that the price function of Dvorak Martini is linear over the pooling and the B pooling intervals. Okay, this is some, uh, some yeah, so <clears throat> uh, we, the main theorem say, says that essentially in every optimal policy, we have these intervals and essentially there are only either pooling intervals or B pooling intervals. And uh, in the context of uh, Dvorak Martini price functions, it tells us that <clears throat> the price function is linear over this uh, over these intervals. Okay, so it was not a coincidence that here we draw a linear function and that here we draw the linear function. Okay, so <clears throat> now the question is how to how to solve the problem, right? So essentially, what we get as an input is this type of a function. Okay, let's assume that the prior is, uh, uh, is uniform. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do, recall that the function has to be pointwise above the function. It is linear by the proposition. And uh, so just by these two, two properties, if we have some B pooling interval, an interval that, has, that essentially touches the function in two different points, then it must be what I'm calling double tangent. Double tangent is a point that touches the function that is pointwise above it and that touches it exactly in two points. Okay, so in this, the, the advantage essentially is that we do not have so too much double tangents in any picture that this is quite uh, yeah so typically the number of typically or uh, formally if the number of convexity concavity regions is n then uh, you have uh, you you will have finitely many double tangents maybe n square at most or something like this okay so you you do not have too many double tangent uh, double tangents and uh, Moreover, uh, not all double tangents are uh, le legal. And let me tell you why. Okay, so why the, the idea is that to guess where the B pooling intervals are located by drawing the double tangents. Okay, so the green is indeed legal one. Uh, why this, the, this uh, L2 is illegal? because these two points are located too extremely far from each other. Namely, there is no mean preserving contraction. Even if we take the entire, this segment, uh, there is no mean preserving contraction that essentially will have these two points as the support. And similarly also for L3, it's, uh, these two points are too far from each other. Here they are close, sufficiently close to each other, okay? So once we have in mind, the, uh, the, once we guess what, uh, how, where is located the B pooling interval, now all we have to do is essentially to try to uh, complete the picture with, with, uh, with drawing only pooling intervals and full revelation. So how a pooling interval will look like a pooling interval must touch a point exactly at one point. And in the case of, of uniform prior, this point must be located exactly at the center of this interval. Z3 should be exactly the average of Y and Y prime. 
Okay. Ja- Jakov, could you could you go back and a slide and and explain again what you mean by the by the by the by those being too far by the peaks? Yes, yes, far. yes, 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 yes. Great. So if you let, let's uh, maybe uh, let's take the example of uh, the uniform distribution over zero one. Okay. So and uh, I'm asking are the is the distribution uh, that has binary support, but the binary support is uh, 0.2 and 0.8, is it a mean preserving contraction of the uniform distribution over 0, 1? The answer is no. Why? Because essentially, so, and in fact, it has a very nice char- uh, characterization in case of uniform distributions, which distributions are, uh, 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 of, on a binary actions, which distributions are implementable? By the way, in the in the in the paper we have a full characterization for any distribution, but in the case of uniform, it's extremely simple. It, uh, a binary support distribution is is a mean preserving contraction of the uniform distribution over the entire segment, if and only if the distance of these two points is at most half of the entire distance. Okay, so since 0.2 and 0.8, their distance is 0.6, which is above one half, it is not implementable. You can meaning, also have... Meaning they could be a mean preserving spread, but not a contraction. Uh, you can uh, just... No, no. You cannot, uh, wait a minute, so can they be an interserving spread? Yes, sorry, yes, yes, yes. I think the answer is yes. They can be an interserving uh, spread, but not an interserving contraction. The intuition for why they cannot be an interserving contraction because, right, you want somehow to to pull, uh, uh, to pull the, the segment uh, zero, uh, right starting from zero to pull it into 0.2 let's say and then you are stuck when you get to 0.4 right what what will you do with the you need to put their mass of uh, of at least uh, uh, one half right but uh, if you do so then you get to the point 0.25 and the posterior the the expectation is not uh, 0.2 rather it is 0.25 all right thanks yeah, and the same here when I say that they are too far from each other. So in the in the context of the uniform distribution, it simply means that the distance of these two points is at le- is at most is more than one half of the entire length of this segment. Okay. Uh, so essentially, what remains after we guessed the the B pooling interval is to try somehow to concatenate it. With other pooling intervals and the B pool and the full full information intervals, and the way to do it is essentially we try to play with this tangent point, and it smoothly moves, and we stop exactly at the point where it touches the function. This is exactly the point where we where we stop, and then we have this nice uh, solution that essentially reveals the state here and uh, pulls this state. Okay. Let me give you one last example uh, very quickly. And here is another very nice curve. Uh, You can also try to draw all the double tangents. Uh, In this case, you will uh, get that only one of them does not violate the the fact that uh, the, uh, only one of them does not violate uh, uh, the, the fact that these two points are not too far from each other. If we try to complement it by uh, uh, in a similar manner to how we did previously, we get this uh, red function. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is the only way to complement it to the entire uh, segment. Unfortunately, this price function is illegal. Why it's illegal? Because these two points, we said one should be above the expectation and the other should be below the expectation. Fortunately, these two points are uh, located both below the expectation. So this is not good. What we deduce from that, that there is no pooling, B pooling interval at all for this function. 
And uh, once we restrict ourselves only to pooling intervals and be pooling intervals, we can just try to draw this kind of uh, conti uh, continuation. We, we first try to do it, let's say, from two from here. We draw a double tangent. Then from here, we have a single place to proceed, which is here, and we are stuck. And we can play with this continuum process of trying the drawing the function. And essentially, after playing with it, you get that this is the solution, that it pulls the 0, y1 to, to z1, y1 to 1, 2 to z2. It fully reveals the state y2 to y3. And finally, it pulls the state z y3 to, to 1 to this point. OK, so this is the price function. And we got to it because in, we reduced the number of options from three, which is pooling, B pooling, and full information, to just two, only pooling and uh, B pooling. Okay, was it a, a luck that we succeeded to solve the two above examples? So it, it turns out that no, we can formulate a concrete exhaustive search procedure that essentially finds an optimal policy over every smooth functions that switches between concavity and convexity finitely many times. Is this procedure efficient? So in context of, uh, in algorithmic context, no. It exhaustive search over exponentially many, of the size of exponential, uh, uh, exponential uh, size, uh, but it, nevertheless, for quite simple examples, namely examples where the function, let's say, switches from concavity to convexity at most five or seven times, you can uh, try to, to do it uh, with a pencil and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, a piece of paper. Uh, you can play with these uh, things and you can actually solve any persuasion. You can play with it and essentially solve any persuasion problem. Uh, yeah. So it's not algorithmically, it's not efficient. Practically, I think you can uh, solve, solve it uh, for even for, for functions yeah, that uh, switches, let's say, seven, uh, seven times is, uh, sh should be more than enough for any, <laughs> right, for any practical application, but uh, yeah. Uh, I have no time to talk about monotonicity in persuasion. Let me uh, finish with an open problem. Uh, so we can think, especially in the context of a partially informed sender, uh, it's very natural to ask, what happens if uh, the, the underlying state theta that is uh, right is not uh, binary, but let's say ternary or some slightly something above two. <laughs> um, so essentially this question, in, if we tr want to try to somehow to apply the same analysis as, as we did here, the most useful thing will be to understand what are the extreme points of the multidimensional mean preserving contractions. And uh, Marco, uh, uh, I had a talk with Marco on this uh, context and he referred me to several very interesting uh, kind of negative results in this direction that, uh, the, but so this is, this, this question is, was Paul, is, is not known. It's an open problem kind of to, to, to understand the, the, the extreme points of multidimensional mean preserving contractions. It's probably <coughs> quite challenging uh, open problem, but yet I think that also even somehow to give uh, interesting counter examples uh, in this context, uh, interesting examples of some crazy things that happened uh, there, um, uh, try somehow to implement this result in the context of uh, persuasion is uh, an interesting open problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, I would like Please. to ask a question. Uh, Yakov, in the example you showed us, you always used finitely many intervals. Yes. Uh, and you said that you can find examples with uh, uh, an infinite number of intervals. Yeah. Uh, but do you have some idea of 
what uh, a class of uh, an interesting class of utility functions for which you can always get uh, an optimal policy with finitely many intervals yes we have it in the paper it's uh, the it, it all has to do with the number of switching from concavity to convexity if the number of uh, of switching points is uh, is at most n we know that you will not need more than n or maybe if i'm not maybe 2n uh, intervals i think if, i think we have a proof a formal proof for 2n but we suspect that it's less that uh, it's maybe n or even uh, n over 2 but in any case but you need something some linear order of uh, of of the number of concavity convexity intervals uh, so this is in the co in the positive side in the negative side remember that theorem 2 in our the main theorem 2 tells us that every b pooling policy has a uh, it can it can be the case that it will be the unique solution uh, of some persuasion problem. The way we prove it is by explicitly constructing a utility function for which this is the case. It's not an abstract uh, proof, uh, and uh, so you can look at the proof of theorem two, and it will tell you how to construct uh, uh, kind of counterexamples or complicated examples where you would need, in fact, in particular, where you need countably many uh, in the number of intervals. Okay, thank you. Any more uh, questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, then we thank Yaakov again for this interesting talk. Thank you. Okay.